This is where they kept food and liquor. And this would be our favorite building. So we're at South Pass City Historic Site, about a half hour from Lander, Wyoming. This is uh, a very important place because all four of the major trails, the Mormon Trail, the uh, Gold Rush Trail, the Pony, Pony Express, Express, and the Oregon Trail all came through this area. And we got the last two spots, last minute reservation for a mine tour where we're gonna go into a gold mine. It's got all the historic tools and machines they used. It's supposed to be awesome. We can't wait. Yes. <laughs> She said meet back at the little Dance store all, yeah. 10 minutes before our tour and we'll meet our guide and then they will take us to the mine. Okay, so we just had our little pre-tour speech at the dance hall. We're driving because what happens is there's like a 20 something person group. We all go in our cars and carpool up to the mine. Um, they told us basically there's four booms and busts in this history of this area. Two in like the 1800s and two in the 1900s. The he said the machinery inside the mine is from the 1940s after World War II. The structure that we're going in I think is from the, the early 1900s. And there's some other structures from the 1800s. This is this at the in the 1800s. This was the second largest town in Wyoming, all because of the first boom here from gold, which and is crazy. Now it's like one of the least. Yeah, and we're pulling up so you can get a view of the mine. We do not go underground. No, the mine is a vertical shaft, where like the one we went in earlier when we toured the town, you go in horizontally. This one is vertical, so they dug straight down and it's full of water. So they have to keep it pumped when they're working in there. And they haven't pumped the well in 25 years. It's crazy. So it looks like we're just gonna be touring the operations of the place. 90 minute tour. Yeah, no bathrooms. He said, uh, uh, hit the bathroom before you go. And it seems like there may be alternative routes to stairs in a couple spots. They mentioned that if you need, if you got an injury, you can't take the stairs. There may be some other ways to go. We'll find but out. We'll let you know at the end. <laughs> I know Kaylee's mom would love to see this. So, yeah. Oh, there's pronghorn too. Where? It's up over that little hill there. The good rock is the quartz, white, glassy, crystally. You've seen gold in this quartz. Most times you can't, but there is still gold. It is pinhead size pieces and smaller, microscopic. This is the stuff you want to keep. Young fellow, maybe about your age, it might be your first job at a mine like this. They're not going to turn you loose with explosives on day one. Yeah. Okay. They're not going to turn you loose with anything you can break on day one. This ore car would be probably your introductory job. Dad would bring you in, your uncle would bring you in, older brother, whatever brings you in. Yep, he's a good worker, he'll show up every day. Give him a job. Tramming, ore, or waste rock. 
out to the dump. There we go. He throws the safety lever over here. You'll see that catch on the front edge. Okay, now is when you would turn this into a dump truck. Only instead of spilling a little bit of this rock out and making a mess, you dump 2,000 pounds. An entire ton of rock would go out there. And of course, you could twist that. I'm going to make this interesting for Emily. Maybe she won't be guiding, guiding a portion of the tour. Okay, we're going to lock that back. Okay, so, number one hazard historically at this mine is slipping and falling down the shaft. You kind of believe that, don't you? Yes. Okay, number two hazard historically is you don't slip and fall, but something falls on you. And the third hazard, we got yours laid in for the fork yet? Oh, yes. All right. I say explosives accidents with explosives the last two people uh, who were killed underground here loaded their drill holes with explosives lit the fuse left the area what do you say you want to go back and check and see what the problem was kaboom wham one guy got crushed when the ceiling came down and the other guy had a rock go through his chest like a bullet so two guys one accident in the 1990s, 25 years or so ago, this ladder way right here is how a group of Canadian geologists and uh, mining engineers went down to investigate the workings. They, remember, this is not safe. You can't get a permit to put anybody on this, but believe it or not, you can climb 300 feet of ladders. So down that ladder, there's a deck in that next deck. There's a trap door with another ladder to another deck, trap doors, ladders, and decks. You've got the map of the place right behind you there. The shaft we're at was enlarged. This is a 1920s map. This shaft right here was connected to level four after World War II. So levels two, three, and four connect to this shaft. So basically three floors underground. The longest one, level four, is four football fields long underground. So when we drove up convoy of vehicles, you drove a couple hundred feet above the mine tunnels that go under that road there. And there's a scope or a cavern where the gold is really rich in that quartz rock. They'll mine it out in a big cavern called a stope. And that stope in the fourth level is taller, no timber in it to hold it up at all, taller than the tower we're standing underneath. That's a 60 foot head frame tower above you right now. And that stope underground is even bigger yet. The shaft area. Power. Power? power? Yeah. Yeah, the power here in 1929, they boiled steam, they boiled water to make steam, and everything was driven with flat belts. So antique power, okay? In 1946, after World War II, that's the modern era, diesel generator in that room right behind us there, and the diesel generator, just like the generator for your camper or whatever like that, only mega-sized, okay? Big power. And it's 480 volt, three phase industrial type power. All right, I will maybe leave this cracked if you haven't taken a peek. I might ask Emily to come up and, and guard that. I'm gonna lead into the next room. And if you wanna take a peek, your photo or something. like you got on your ATV or your truck. It is. Big drum, wire rope on it. As it pulls the cable in, the cage comes up from underground. And again, as you let the cable back out, down, down, down it goes. Three different levels. Picture the bottom level being 300 feet. How are they gonna communicate? Hey, pull me up. No, they're gonna communicate. Again, this job at a mine, even today, is considered the top job, the most responsible job, maybe outside of the manager, the superintendent, somebody like that. Because when you get on that cage and you give them a thumbs up, I'm ready to go, 
Your life is in their hands. They have to be paying attention. They can't fool around. There can't be any, ha, 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 we're going to play a joke on. No, this is entirely business. All of these pieces of equipment are heavy. And why do I have an assistant half my age, a quarter my age? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, he's all muscle, right? And I'm all brain power here. What's the lead miner do? He looks typically at the back. I need that steel, please. Okay. He looks at the back, and he looks at that quartz that's in the ceiling, in the back. And he picks, because there's no geologist, there's no mining engineer, he knows where to put the holes. So that when they drill them, this such and such an angle. This one's close at this angle. This one's this deep. He knows how to break the rock effectively, efficiently, safely. The younger guy, are you paying attention? Or are you? Yeah. All right, he's paying attention. Year after year of being a, a helper, you're going to get better at this, aren't you? Manually drilling holes. Yeah. For the dynamite stuff. Yes, for the dynamite. First, it was uh, cannon powder or, or gun powder that they used. You then in that second boom, they had air drills and dynamite. Yeah. Wow. Oh, it's cool. here. This open pit or discovery shaft is where mining started in June of 1867. This was still Dakota territory in 1867. So for the first two years of mining in this location, it was Dakota territory. In 1869, Wyoming is born. And uh, they kept digging another year and another year until they hit the water level the natural water table, and all the early gold rush digging stopped about 80 feet down. You just hit water. And the second boom, third and fourth boom, all took place in parts of the mine that are permanently underwater if you're not pumping. So this is really the oldest workings at the site that I can show you. What's neat about this pit though is 500 ounces of gold came out of this pit. A mega rich volume of of gold came out of here and I told you already it wound up going to Fort Bridger. Fort Bridger was the crossroads of this part of the West. Telegraph, military, emigrants all through there. Salt Lake City's just over the, the Wasatch there, hop, skip and a jump. Went from 15 guys in 1867 to 3,000 in 1868. A gold rush. or so and break down those bigger pieces by hand with a sledgehammer 
so that it could fall through those bars into this crusher, falling in about the size of a baseball and coming out, oh wow, we're running low, <laughs> about the size of a golf ball. And then it would go from this crusher, which functions basically as a giant mortar and pestle that you would use for the herbs or such, such things. And then it would go into this machine, the bucket elevator, which then carries it on up to the next level for the next crusher. sludge of sand waste going out the bottom you continually add it continually overflows gold water and cyanide to this filtration tank back behind here I pulled one filter element up out of it you can see it's just cotton canvas they uh, coat that with diatomaceous earth a real fine porous clarifying agent at the in it so by the time it gets to this tank right here gold water and cyanide to this big tank it looks, I've been drinking my water here, but if I had a bottle of Sprite, you could picture in your head, okay, clear. All right, in that Sprite, there's sugar dissolved, I can't see it, all right? There's citrus flavor dissolved, I can't see it. And when you take the lid off your Sprite, you hear that 
There's gas in there too that you can't see. So the shaking, stirring action down below, by the time the liquid gets here, it looks just crystal clear, but there's also dissolved gas in it, dissolved gold, dissolved cyanide in it. So they pull a switcheroo after this tank. Down below, kind of where we can see over here, there's a real pointed cone feeder tank down there. And the scientists who developed this process in Europe uh, learned that cyanide wants to pick up and grab powdered metals. Maybe it's uh, zinc dust or aluminum dust or lead or copper. The only material it doesn't really react with, eagerly anyway, is iron. It's pretty low on cyanide's friends list. So the cyanide has grabbed gold and taken it away from that tank. And when it passes by the filter or the feeder over there, zinc dust is added to it. So gold, water, cyanide, and now zinc, powdered zinc shavings get injected. And so as that slurry is going through the pipe there, the cyanide is seeing that there's zinc dust available to pick up. Well, what has it got to do? It's got to drop the gold that it's already carrying. So it picks up the zinc. Who cares? Zinc is like 30 cents a pound. Very inexpensive. That flow returns to a main recovery tank up there in the rafters, a secondary recovery tank here. And inside the tank, this one has about, oh, four dozen of these fittings in there. Okay, cotton sock or bag hanging off the end. They call this a sock filter or a bag filter. Gold, water, cyanide, and zinc go in the top. The water, the cyanide, and the zinc are liquid, so they'll keep going through the bag. The gold has been precipitated, dropped as a solid, and it gets caught in the mesh of the bag. So at the end of the week, like I said, Bob and Terry weren't allowed up here, but at the end of the week, the boss comes over to the sink here with his chemist, and he starts turning these socks inside out, scraping the slime of gold particles and excess zinc. Kind of looks like a, a gray white slime, basically. There's so much extra zinc in there. Looks like zinc oxide uh, sunscreen, maybe. So you scrape that out of your bag, you bring it to this high temperature furnace here. Of uh, gold and zinc particles going in this crucible, going in the furnace, 2,200 degrees. <laughs> Supercharged, superheated. And when everything melts in there, they'll tip the furnace over and pour into this pointed mold right here. This pointed mold, okay, the heavy things go to the bottom, gold goes to the bottom of that mold. And on top will float a crust of excess zinc and iron. So on the bottom of this, because the mold is pointy, it's going to have a pound or two pounds of gold on the bottom of this. Take a hammer and a chisel, break that off, throw this away, right? The gold sits aside because before they're done, they've got one more recovery stream to use. The concentrate, that stuff in the vial, Everything that's heavy in the, uh, the ore, not pure gold, but valuable. About 200 pounds of that concentrate in the barrel. About 200 pounds of, what do you think? What's your guess? What is it? Iron? Iron, yeah. And they are worn out grinding balls, worn out drill bits. And when it goes in this barrel, it's not to pulverize. It's to polish, to scour and polish, make that gold really reactive. So after a little bit of tumbling in this barrel, I don't know who's allergic to, anybody allergic to mercury? <laughs> they add in not one pound, be careful, not one pound, but about 25 or 30 pounds, about half of this container, a gigantic globule of mercury churning and swimming through there, it rejects the sand, it rejects the iron, but it dissolves only the gold. Mercury is brought over here, they put it in a sealed vessel, they're going to boil it off as a vapor, collect it, condense it, and reuse it. And of course, what's left behind after you evaporate the mercury? The gold part. So you take your gold from this process with mercury, your gold from that process with cyanide, Put another vessel inside the furnace. And this time when you melt and pour, you don't pour into the pointed mold, you pour into the bar, the ingot mold. 
And so this time when you pour, their average pour, we know, was about 85 ounces, Troy. Does that look real? I tried to make it look real. Today, this is about $180,000, if it were real. So yeah, the fourth graders are like, give me that bar. So now you've got a lead bar with about, oh, 25 coats of paint on it. <laughs> so these bars could only be bought by Uncle Sam. The U.S. government was the only legal buyer of gold. And of course, South Pass City's out in the middle of nowhere. Thank you, sir. Got your mercury ration for the day. These bars went to Denver Mint in the U.S. mail. They, post, they posted these in South Pass City, and the mail carriers took the gold bars from one to the next to the next in the United States mail. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Um, we know it was very long and a lot of information, but we thought it was very interesting, so we wanted to share as much as we could. Uh, next week, we're hoping to do an RV upgrades video for some of the changes that we've made. Our time is running very low in Wyoming. I can't say I'm sad about that. <laughs> we're ready to go home and spend a little time. Um, with our family and we look forward to passing you guys on the highway on our way home to Florida very soon. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you guys next week.